John chapter 9. We're going to study from verse 1 to 18, but let's uh, read a little chunk starting at verse 6. So John 9, 6. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with, sal with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. Father, thank you so much that you not only sent your son to heal physical eyes, but to open spiritual eyes, Lord. And uh, that's what we want. And that's what we need. Open our eyes, Lord. Help us to see uh, you. Help us to see awesome things in your word. Open our ears that we would... Uh, hear what the Spirit has to say to us through this passage. Uh, open our hearts to all you have for us, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So this passage shows us one of the most amazing miracles of Jesus. He gave sight to a, blind, a man who was born blind. Um, there were a lot of miracles in the Bible before Jesus came. Uh, in the Old Testament, God used a variety of prophets to do things like heal the sick and cleanse lepers and raise the dead, multiply resources, call down fire from heaven and other things. But Jesus is the only one who ever gave sight to the blind. I mean, a lot of the miracles we see in the Gospels happened in the Old Testament here and there. But Jesus is the only one that restored sight to the blind. And he did it more than once. And so this is a really amazing story, not only for the miracle itself, but also just for the lessons that we learn and how it happened. So verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man, a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. So that Jesus and his disciples, they're walking along and they see this blind man that they're already familiar with. Somehow they already know who he is and they know that he was born blind. Later on in the passage, we see other people knew who he was. He was probably some sort of fixture there and maybe people talked to him, but they, they knew him. They knew of him. They knew his circumstance that not only was he blind, but he'd always been blind. But with Jesus, they're walking by and they see him. And so they, the disciples want to ask a question. If I had Jesus with me all the time, I'd be asking him a million questions. I'd be like the little kid that's asking, you know, that's what I'd be doing. And, and they wanted to know whose sin caused the man to be born blind. Was it his own? Which is sort of a strange thing to think, because, like, how does that work? Did he somehow sin in the womb? Did they believe in reincarnation? They shouldn't. The Bible doesn't teach that, that somehow he sinned in a former life and now he came back blind. You know, but how could he be, you know, how could he be responsible for this? But that's what, that was one thought they had. And, and, or the other was, was it his parents' fault? Like, did they somehow sin in some way that now their son had to pay for it and was punished for it during his life? And, and either way, they thought, bottom line, their thinking is, this guy's blind and it's somebody's fault. And, and so to them, someone sinned and this man's blindness was the consequence. That part they knew, at least they thought they knew. And they just wanted to know who, who did it. We don't know why they wanted to know that. Maybe they wanted to know, you know, okay, we want to make sure we don't do that. We don't want our kids being born blind. But, but. 
um, Jesus is going to talk about that, but let's, the first part of verse 3, uh, real quick, it says, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sin. And so the very first thing he does, and he has more than one thing to say about this, but the very first thing that Jesus does is he, he corrects them. And, and his answer tells us that their very question is based on a wrong idea. That, that the wrong idea that they had was that suffering or sickness or poor health was directly linked to someone's sin. That was their idea, and Jesus right away wanted to show them that that was wrong. That wrong idea has been rampant throughout history, by the way. I mean, go all the way back to Job, which is probably the first Bible book ever written, and Job's friends had that same idea. You know, they were verbally beating him up about all his suffering because they were certain that he must have deserved it somehow for some sin that he did. He just wasn't admitting. And, and, And here it is, you know, thousands of years later, and Jesus' disciples still have this same kind of thinking. And today, there's still people, whether they consciously think it or subtly just it, you know, colors the way they think about things, people still think this way sometimes. And they think about it, and they'll think, and they'll apply it to lots of different areas of life, including health. You know, they'll they'll think of they'll look at someone who maybe they're struggling financially and they'll think it mu- they must have done something wrong they must have done somebody obviously messed up i wonder what they did cuz look at how how much they're struggling financially or they see someone who's been out of work and it's been a while longer than they think the person should be out of work and they think clearly somebody did something wrong i wonder what he did you know or or they see a struggle you know at at in a family and they see kids not walking with the Lord and they think, man, I wonder what those parents did to make their kids not walk with the Lord. I mean, they're Christians, but their kids not walking with the Lord. So I wonder what they must have really blown it as parents. Or they see some ongoing health issue. And again, they're like, well, I had that health issue, but it didn't last as long as this guy's health issue. So he must be doing something wrong. He must be sinning. Somebody must be sinning. And we could probably come up with a thousand other examples. But the point is, it's not uncommon for people to think um, that they see a struggle that someone's having and they, they think somebody's sinning, somebody's doing something wrong, somebody's messing up here. And that's what the disciples thought, and so they just wanted to ask about that. Now, there are many problems that do and can arise directly as a result of sin. People... You know, as sinners, we often unnecessarily suffer things that we don't have to because we make really bad choices and, and, and do, you know, or it could be we suffer sometimes with the sin of other people. Somebody sins and it hurts us. And that, that's all real and true. But not all suffering can be directly linked to a specific sin. You know, it's, and, and the bigger thing is, It's not helpful to think that way. And that's why Jesus addresses this part of it first. He wanted to show them that, that their thinking was wrong and it needed correcting. That they basically, the whole question was based on bad doctrine that they had in their mind. Because as long as they believed that, it would hinder them from acting with the compassion that Jesus shows people. As long as they thought suffering was some sort of punishment, well, you don't, un- you don't interfere with someone's deserved punishment. If they need to be punished, they need to be punished. So we just kind of back off and go, oh, I'm going to try to avoid what that guy did. because, you know, and, and, and as long as that's how they thought, you know, the best they could do is I'm going to steer clear of whatever he did. Don't want to end up like that. And, and, you know, there's not a, that's not a bad idea to say that guy's life is a mess and I know why. And so, I, you know, lesson learned, cautionary tale, here, his life. But, but Jesus wanted them and us to see that those struggling in life need more than just us to be, you know, warned by. And they need more than us to pity and they need more than us to be disgusted about. And he wanted, to, he wanted them and us to have good ideas 
that lead to compassion and, and not just ideas that lead to like what he do. And that's what he wanted to show them. When I was young, and I don't know how young I was, but I was young enough to not have a good grasp on how money worked. We were at, we were in Lake Tahoe, and they had this, uh, I think it was in Harrah's underground, they had this like uh, arcade area that adults could check their kids into while they went to the casino, and I was, my brother and I were checked into that area. And we had money, we were given money. And I remember, I remember running out of quarters. And I was young enough to not know, but I had some dollar bills still. I ran out of quarters, all the games took quarters, but I still had some dollar bills. But I was, I was young, I was so young, I didn't know how many quarters were in a dollar. That's how young I was, and I remember this. And I remember like going, well, I have money, but I don't have quarters. And I remember seeing an older kid pull out like a handful of quarters. He had, I knew he had a whole bunch of quarters. So I went up to him, and I handed him a dollar and said, hey, I'll trade you this dollar for a quarter. <laughs> and I did it a number of times. And he was like, cha-ching, you know, sucker's born every day, you know, whatever. And, uh, and then, of course, then my money ran out again. And, and you know, I, and so I was out of money, and I'm just sitting there, you know, just waiting. And I don't know how long it was before I got picked up. And, and you know, I don't remember what else happened, but I, I would imagine, like, my brother or my you know, whoever else picked, I don't want to, I don't want to put anybody under the bus who took me on this trip, but uh, I, it's only a limited number of people it could have been, so. Uh, but, you know, they could have been thinking, man, he really stinks at video games, or they could have been thinking, man, he's really not good with money, and, and, uh, or he's, what did he do, what did he waste his money on, what did he buy candy or something, or, None of those was true. The, the truth was I, I was bad at math or I was bad at understanding how money worked. It wasn't that I was bad at video games or anything like that. I just had a wrong idea in my head that uh, somehow a dollar is worth a quarter or a quarter is worth a dollar. And so it was the bad idea that made me do something like that. And, and with this bad idea fixed in the minds of the disciples, you know, they could have been a they, they could be seen in a, in a way that wasn't accurate. They could be seen as being heartless and cold. If you think that people who are suffering deserve it, then you're very, much, you know, you're apt to not treat them the way Jesus would treat them. And that would, could be seen as heartless and cold. But the truth is they just had bad theology. And, and uh, you know, we're prone to that. We're prone to having bad theology. We're prone to having preconceived ideas that just for whatever reason, either we were taught it or we just thought it and nobody ever showed us otherwise. And, and we need those kind of things fixed in our minds, whatever they are. Sometimes that affects just your very relationship with God. You're, you have a hard time as a Christian simply because you just don't have the right thoughts about who God is and how he works and about life and love and what sin is and, and about his forgiveness and you just don't have the right information. And so you're constantly struggling as a Christian or you're constantly miserable as a Christian and you think that you're terrible at it. And, and it's not really that you're terrible at it, it's just that you got wrong ideas that need correcting. And so the good news for these guys is they were close to the Lord and they asked a lot of questions and the Lord was able to straighten out when they had these dumb ideas. And that's what we want to do. We want to stay close to the Lord, ask him a lot of questions, and be ready for him to go, you're totally wrong on that. Let's, let's get you sorted out on that. And, and let him do that. You know, Be ready to be wrong. I mean, we're still wrong. After many years, you still get things that he brings up and you're like, that, that's not right. I shouldn't. And so he knows how to set us straight. Verse 3 again, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me 
while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So he already showed them how they were thinking wrong just by saying, no, that's not it. And now he starts to show them the right way to think. And he basically, the things that he's saying here, he's, he's telling them how he sees the situation. And this is what he's communicating by what he just said. He's saying, when I see a, a, a man like this blind man here, I'm not thinking about his sin or somebody else's sin or you know what, what was done wrong here. I see it as an opportunity for the works of God to be revealed. That's how I see the situation. I'm not looking for the cause of his suffering. I'm thinking about what can be done to help him. I'm thinking about what God can do for this man and how God might use me to do that. A man suffering blindness or anything else isn't just an opportunity for us to discuss the causes and the unfortunate situations of suffering in life and who's guilty and all that. It's a chance to do the works of God. That's what it is. And, and the Lord continued in verse 4 by saying, that's why I'm here. He said, I, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. In other words, as long as I'm here, I, I'm going to be doing the works of God. I have to. I must. And, and not only that, it's, he says, while it's day, meaning as long as I'm able, as long as the time is right, as long as, and that time is limited. You don't have forever to help somebody out. So as long as it's day, when the time is right, when you see the need, that's when the works need to be done. You don't have time to be going, whose fault is this? The person needs help. In other words, this man needs help. He needs God's help. And Jesus is saying, and that's what I'm here for. I must work God's works. And how, do God, how does God work? He works with love and compassion and restoration and concern. And that's what he does. And then he also added something he said earlier in chapter 8 about being the light of the world. He said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And that's very fitting here since this is a blind man who, in a sense, lives his whole life in physical darkness. And Jesus is basically saying, I'm going to turn the light on for this guy, so to speak. And so when you see all that, it's night and day compared to what they thought and the way that they thought and the way they saw the world and how completely different Jesus looked at this man than they did and how completely different Jesus, look, Jesus looks at the world than we often do. We, we are so capable of seeing in terms of how dark everything is and how terrible everything is and how horrible it all is. But the Lord looks at the world in terms of, okay, we got our work cut out. We have stuff to do. There's things to show. If they're suffering, then okay, then that means we have an opportunity to bring compassion. If there's darkness, okay, I'm the light of the world. It's time for me to shine. And, and so the Lord shows us the right heart toward all the suffering around us. This illustration is used many times. I've probably used it several times, but it just, it's so apt here. You know, you, you get to an accident on the road and there's two sets of emergency vehicles that show up on the scene there's the police and then there's the paramedics or the EMTs and the police you know their job is part of their job is to find out you know at some point they're going to figure out who who whose fault was this who caused this was somebody speeding did somebody run a red light is somebody drunk was somebody looking at their phone they're, that's what you know that's going to be a part of their concern but the paramedics are there, and they're not concerned about that at all. They're just like, who's hurt? Who needs help? And they don't ask, oh, it's your fault. We're not going to help you. Like, who, who needs help? That's, your, that's their job. And the thing is, is yes, it's true that there wouldn't be any suffering in the world apart from sin. And, and, uh, but because of sin, there's, you know, whether it's directly the fault of somebody or indirectly the result of sin, sin destroys lives. That's true. But Jesus came to bring healing and wholeness and restoration 
And, and he wants to teach us as his disciples to do that, to be like that. And it, it's got to start with just even the very way we think about somebody who's having struggles and suffering. It has to start there. It, 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 you know, so we need our thinking straightened out. And maybe you're here right now or you're listening from somewhere else and, you know, with a, a mess in your life or a lot of pain. And maybe it's due to something completely out of your control. Like, it just came. It just happened. Or maybe it is your own fault. Maybe you did bring it on yourself. Whatever it is, either way, the Lord wants you to know that he has compassion for you. He's for you. He wants to help. He wants to bring wholeness into your life. Even if it was your own bad decisions that made the mess or somebody else's. Or maybe you're someone else. Maybe you're fine right now. You don't really have a mess of your own. But you see a lot of messes around you. You still need right thinking there. For, for people like that, maybe, maybe the Lord wants to train you a little bit of a little bit more how to be an EMT and a little bit less of how to be a cop all the time in that sense. And so God wants to show you his heart of love in circumstances like the one here. If you see someone in a mess, you know, we do a lot better to reveal the heart of God when we show care than, than, we point, than when we point fingers. And, and the Holy Spirit is really good at pointing the finger and bringing the conviction where it's needed. We should just leave that to him. He's really good at it. But we're, we're called to love, and we need to see hurting people as an opportunity to show what the love of God really looks like. And so that's what Jesus is teaching in there. Verse 6, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. He went and wa- so he went and washed and came back seen. I think that's pretty interesting. They got sent to Siloam because I've been there. It's down at the bottom of the city of David. It's downhill from like the, the main area of the city. And so he has to go down there. And if you're going to Israel with us, we will go there. Um, anyway, um, we get the healing here. And it's amazing and it's weird. Jesus made mud with dirt and his own spit, rubbed it on the guy's eyes, and then told him to, you know, hike down the hill, basically, wash in the pool of Siloam, and then, and, and, and so the man did it, and he was healed. And how weird is that? What was the guy thinking? If it were me, I'd be like, uh, dude, what are you doing? You know, like, like <laughs> spitting mud. Probably Jesus was saying to him while he was doing that, and probably we don't have everything recorded that happened, in the, and we have a pretty good guess on that because later on, when other people start asking him what happened, he says a man called Jesus did this, and we don't have a record of him, Jesus saying, hi, my name's Jesus, I'm going to anoint your eyes with my spit mud. But it happened, so, you know, we have more record than what happened here. And so, um, anyway, that's what Jesus did, and the, the, the blind man's eyes were opened, and this amazing miracle happened, and this blind man could see. And in some ways, it's par for the course. You read through the Gospels, and Jesus is, it's like multitudes of people. We have no idea how many hundreds or thousands of people he healed and, and did things for, and and there's really only a limited number of highlighted cases that we have through the Gospels. Any, 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 we see, and, but when we look at those highlighted cases, we see that he healed people different ways. There was variety in the way that he worked miracles. Here we have the spit mud guy in his eyes. There's other places where he healed blindness by just, there's one that says he just touched the, guy, the person's eyes. 
Mark 7 tells of another blind man that Jesus didn't use mud, he just used spit, and he spit in the guy's eyes. And then there's other places where Jesus healed people by just a word, just saying it. In other words, he didn't stick to a single method when he was healing. He didn't follow or repeat a formula. He did it differently, and I think part of the reason for that is because that way we know for certain, with certainty that it wasn't the method or the technique, but it was just Jesus that did it. That, and this man was healed by Jesus. He wasn't healed by a formula. And, and that's important because people are given to wanting to follow formulas and methods. People like that kind of stuff. And if, if Jesus healed people like this every time, then you know there'd be all kinds of peep Christians today going around making spit mud and trying to put it in people's eyes. There'd probably be even a church called the church, the spit mud community church or whatever. We like those kinds of solutions. We like our problems solved with a pill or with three steps or in five short days. We like that kind of stuff. And the church often has, you know, that kind of stuff catches on. You know, somebody writes a book. They're well-meaning. They notice a prayer of Jabez hidden there in a, in, in a book that doesn't have a lot, and it's the prayer of Jabez. And there's nothing wrong with what was taught in that book. This is dated if you don't know, you know. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. But the next thing you know is there's people picking this book up going, just you just got to pray the prayer of Jabez. It's all you got to do. Or 40 days of purpose. You know, just 40 days and just the purpose. And, and, and there's many, you know, the authors probably meant well, and they didn't necessarily, maybe, I don't know, didn't mean, hey, here's the, there's the formula. It's just, just as simple. You just follow this. But what happens is when you buy into formulas like that, you're, it's, it's always at the expense of trusting Jesus, trusting the Lord. You know? And most people know that's not how it works, but it's easy to get caught up into. Imagine if a sports team did that. Imagine if a football team did that. This team, our team is are just, we're just not having success year after year. When we look at, well, let's look at the, I don't know, let's look at the... Um, Kansas City Chiefs, man, they've had a lot of success in recent years. Let's watch one of their games. Hey, they, this is their, uh, these are the plays they played, and it got them a victory. Let's just run the same plays. If it got them a victory, it'll get us a victory. We'll just run the same plays. We all know that's not how it works. Those plays weren't magical. There was more to it. And we need to be aware of looking for some magical method. When we, because it'll always take our eyes off what, where it really comes from, our real source, trusting the Lord, obeying the Lord, following the Lord. Just, you know, beware of trying to think that there's some sort of formula, that that's all it takes. Get away from that false, false idea and trust Jesus. Now, if we wanted to take something practical from the way that Jesus did this miracle, we can. There's, we could probably look at a principle here, and I think it's a, a decent one. You look at what he did as principle and then kind of follow that. Here, like this. Jesus used saliva. We could say Jesus used something of himself. He gave something of himself. Jesus used soil. We could say Jesus used resources close at hand, available to him. Jesus anointed the man. We could say that Jesus touched him in his place of need, touched his eyes. Jesus gave a command. He spoke the word of God to him. And, and then the man submitted himself to all these things and obeyed it. And he experienced the power of the Lord. We could, we could take that as a principle to apply without making it some weird formula that that's how it does. We could say, here's somebody in need and I, I want to give of myself to help them, use what's available, touch the person in love, and speak the word of God to them, not guaranteeing a miracle is going to happen, but at least knowing I'm acting like Jesus toward this person, and God will do what he wants with it. We can do that. We just don't need to get all weird and go, oh, this is the formula, this is how you do it. Verse 8, Therefore the, 
the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he's like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, well, where is he? He said, I don't know. So apparently, again, this blind beggar was known around town. People were, were, were familiar with him enough to know that now they all of a sudden they see him not where they normally see him and not how they normally see him, not sitting and begging. But now he's kind of up and about, and they're like, hey, isn't that the blind beggar? And some of them said, hey, you know it is. Wow. And other people said, no, it couldn't be. It just looks like him. And I, and I get that part of it. You ever seen someone out of context and it totally throws you off? Like you're just used to seeing them in a certain place and all of a sudden it's like they're in a different place. It's like your worlds have collided and you're like, I remember when, when I was a kid seeing my teacher at the movie theater. That was the <laughs> bizarrest thing I ever, I was like, what? <laughs> like maybe you'd see me at, the, at Costco and you're like, I know you. I feel like there should be something in front of you from waist down and, you know. But when you see someone out of context, it's a little bit weird and kind of like that, you know, and they're, they're seeing him and, they're, and, and he's like, no, really, it's me. And, and so they start to ask, well, what happened? You can see? How did that happen? And he, and he just tells them the story. It's not a huge story. It's an amazing story. Not a lot to it, though. Jesus came, and this man named Jesus, he anointed my eyes. He told me to go wash. I did, and I can see now. And then, of course, you know, and like anyone, I would think, would be like, well, where is he? <laughs> and, and he didn't know. But it's cool because here's, here's the guy's day. He gets up, same old routine, begging, blind. Jesus comes along, blesses him. He didn't even ask for it. Jesus came to him, blesses him, touches him restores his sight, comes back, everybody notices, and, and so they start asking, and what does he do? He starts telling people about Jesus and about what Jesus did in his life. And, and he's witnessing, he's giving his testimony, he's sharing about what the Lord has done in his life. He's been, he was touched by Jesus within hours and this is going on he didn't have any training he didn't go to bible college he didn't have anything like that he was touched by jesus changed dramatically so dramatically that people could tell and they just start asking him simple questions what happened and and he spoke up they they this happened because they noticed a change and they asked about it and people do that still people always ask about changes you get your hair cut if you get it hair cut uh, significantly or change the style significantly people are going to ask no question drop 10 or 15 pounds people are going to notice they're go somebody's going to say not everybody but somebody's going to say something Whoa, what happened? And they're just amazed. People notice changes. And when Jesus comes into your life for real, you know, you, you really respond to his call. You really do. You say, I'm, I'm repenting of my old way of living, and I'm going to live this way now by believing and trusting and following Jesus. And you're not just talking about getting religious and trying to start going to church. You're talking about I'm following him and trusting him as Lord and Savior. If that happens in your life and you don't try to hide it on purpose, you shouldn't try to hide it on purpose. You shouldn't try to hide it at all. But if that's what happens in your life, without a doubt, somebody's going to notice. And if you don't like cut yourself off from everybody you ever knew before, they're going to notice. And inevitably somebody probably more than one is going to say somehow some way what's up and you don't even have to try to be noticed 
And, and you walk with the Lord, and they're going to see that change in you. And, and when they ask, just tell them what happened. I started following Jesus. That's what happened. Make sure you get that part right. It wasn't I started going to church. Lots of people go to church, have no change in their life. I started following Jesus. And he did it. He did this in my life. He's the one that changed me. And Psalm 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're redeemed, say you are. When you have opportunity. And I think every real Christian wants to tell people about Jesus. And I think, you know, for some people, it's just for whatever reason, it comes more naturally. And for other people, for, for whatever reason, I don't know, they're timid or they don't know what to say. This is it right here. If you walk with the Lord truly and, and, and seek to follow him and have a, a regular relationship with him, and then don't try to hide what he's doing in your life, then when somebody who already knew you starts to notice, and it might not come out like, hey, weren't you blind and now you can see? It'll be, it'll be something else. Hey, what's, how come you're always going to church? I don't remember you going to church before. It's the same question. I'm following Jesus now. Hey, how come, how come you're not, you don't want to go out drinking with us on Friday nights after, church, after work anymore? Well, I, I'm following Jesus now. I don't, I don't want that anymore. Or, hey, it seems like, I remember you used to have a really foul mouth, you know. What, whatever, it could be anything. Whatever else it may be, just tell him it was Jesus. He's working in my life. You don't have to like feel like, oh, I got to bring it home and get them to get on their knees and pray to receive Jesus right there. I mean, if you can, that'd be amazing, but this, is, this works. This is good. This is, you know, it's simple. Don't overcomplicate it. If you're walking with Jesus, somebody's going to ask something and say something. Verse 13, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I wash and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So after hearing about the miracle, these the people took this man to the Pharisees. It, we don't know exactly why. It seems like it could have been one of two things. It, Maybe they just wanted to show them these are the spiritual leaders. Hey, this miracle happened. Or maybe they were thinking about, hey, this happened on a Sabbath. We don't really know. But the Pharisees asked the man how he got his sight restored. Because, you know, they bring him and they say, this man got his sight restored. And so like, well, how did that happen? And, of course, the man's story is simple. He knows his story. He knows what happened to him. So he tells them about the mud and the washing and, and, you know, you hear that if you're in, that, if you're in the shoes of the uh, uh, Pharisees here, there's different ways you could respond, different ways you might expect somebody to respond hearing a story like that. Kind of the two main would be with either excitement or with doubt, you know. Yeah, right. Come on. Or, really? Wow. Wait, so you were blind this morning in your whole life and now you can see? What's that like? You know, it's got to be one of those two things, typically. I mean, there's, but these guys neither deny it or celebrate it. They're just mad. Because all they can see is that Jesus violated the Sabbath, and that means he's a sinner. Now, their claim that he violated the Sabbath was probably based on one or two ideas. First, he made clay, and that would constitute working, making clay would constitute working. And so if that's what he did, then he broke the Sabbath. The other is even worse than that, that he healed this man completely on the Sabbath. And according to their rules, healing on the Sabbath was only permissible if it was a life and death situation. And even then, you could only 
stop the person from getting worse, but you couldn't make them better. You had to just get them stable and then, you know, do more treatment to get them better the next day. That was their rules. And so because of those rules, yes, Jesus violated those rules. And to them that meant he violated the Sabbath because those were the Sabbath rules to them. And then there were other people who, you know, they said, he's not a sinner. How could he do these things? And so they were divided once again, and we keep seeing that. Verse 17, then they, they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. So they asked the man his opinion about Jesus. And the, the man already has that all figured out. He's like, he's a prophet, which is to say, they're saying, what do you think of this man? He's like, he's a man of God. When he says that, that's what he means. He's a man, this is a man of God, a man from God, a man whom God is working through. And, and it, that was clear and simple. He knew what Jesus did for him. He knew, you know, what that meant. No question whatsoever, Jesus is from God. But the religious leaders also had a clear answer in their mind about all this. But theirs also came from bad doctrine as the way that the disciples, the disciples there that day weren't the only ones with bad doctrine. These guys are spiritual leaders and they have bad doctrine. And they, they said that he doesn't keep the Sabbath, so he's a sinner. And if Jesus really did break the Sabbath, he really would be a sinner. But Jesus didn't break the Sabbath. He only broke their legalistic interpretation of, of sabbatic rules. He broke their rules, not God's commands about the Sabbath. And so he didn't do anything wrong. He did something amazing and awesome on the Sabbath day, which is permitted. I, I, I kind of would speculate that he healed the man the way he did on the Sabbath because it was the Sabbath in order to deal with these knuckleheads who had these stupid, wrong Sabbath rules. And they needed those confronted just as much or if not more than the disciples needed their wrong ideas confronted because their bad doctrine blinded them to the work of God. It blinded them to this amazing miracle. Here's a man healed of a lifelong issue that, and it's confirmed by witnesses. It's an awesome and amazing miracle. And all they can think about is, he, that man broke the Sabbath. And, and we've said this before about these guys, but... It, here it is again. We just need to beware of spiritual arrogance and the bad doctrine that comes along with it because it blinds us. It blinds us from seeing the work of God that he might be doing all around us. Remember Dr. Seuss, green eggs and ham? I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I I don't like them in a house with a mouse, not, in the, not, in a, not on a train, not in the rain, not in a box, not with a fox, not here or there, not anywhere. He didn't even try them. This is the end of the book, right? You get to the end of the book. He's like, wait a minute. These are actually pretty good, man. I do like green eggs and ham. But that was his issue. And these guys are just like that. They, I do not like this Jesus. Not, not here or there, not in a not with a fox, not on a box, not in the rain, not on a train. I don't like him. I don't like his miracles on the Sabbath. I don't like him healing the man at the pool of the Bethesda. I don't like him, you know, healing the man with the withered hand. I don't like him giving a man his sight on the Sabbath. I don't like that guy. <clears throat> and it's so sad because they, none of them were doing any miracles. They didn't like his miracles on the Sabbath. So much that, you know, here miracles are happening around them. And they're not amazed. And he didn't break the Sabbath. It was just their bad doctrine. That's all he was breaking. It's good to break bad doctrine. If you're, you have permission to break bad doctrine. You know? 
And, and so beware of letting bad doctrine blind you from the great work of God. Their bad doctrine came from being fully immersed in the way they did things. Now, when you get immersed in the way you do things, it's not necess- just that in and of itself is not a bad thing. I really like Calvary Chapel. I am a Calvary Chapel guy. I know lots of other Christians. I know other pastors that are not Calvary Chapel guys, and I love them, and I know they love Jesus. But I like Calvary Chapel. I just like the way we do it. I don't think we're perfect at all. I don't think that. But I like the way we do things. But if I were to take the things that make Calvary Chapel distinct from other types of churches and somehow try to make those like, this is the only absolute truth. You know, and all those other churches are wrong. Then if I encounter somebody who's involved with some other type of church and God's doing amazing things there, which he does, I might respond the same way these guys do. I don't know. I don't know. It's probably not real. It's probably fake probably not good, you know. Oh, there, people are coming to Christ and getting saved and being baptized. I don't know if they're really saved. I don't know. I think you just see how ugly that is. Calvary Chapel began against that kind of thing. You know, if you know the story, you know, they're, they're, these hippies start coming to church. Hippies weren't going to church, and they were coming to church. And people, you know, and they didn't wear ties or suits or shoes, you know. But God was definitely at work, and some people have completely missed out on that because they're like, no, 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 that's not how it works. He's breaking the, they're breaking the rules over there. And, uh, you know, their hair's long, they got beards, tie-dye, and anyway, anyway. And there's people today that still do that. They focus on things in a twisted kind of way, and they miss the work of God. And we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be old wineskins, you know. Make us new, Lord. We, and we don't want to be spiritual snobs. We don't want to put God in a box. And uh, we don't want to be like that. We don't want bad ideas that make us miss what God is doing right now. Maybe, maybe you have a bad idea that's not only making you miss what God's doing around you, but maybe you have a bad idea that's keeping you from God. And maybe that bad idea is, the Lord can't work in my life. The Lord can't forgive me my sins. The Lord wouldn't care about somebody like me. The Lord isn't interested. I'm this or that. Or That is a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Let the Lord open your eyes. Reject that idea. He came into this world for you. He came to pursue you. He came after you. He left heaven and said, I'm going to go down there because I'm on a rescue mission and I want to save them. So don't hold on to that bad idea that he wouldn't work in your life. Believe that he would. And then believe what he said to believe. He died on the cross for your sins. Your sins are the problem. Our sins are the problem. That's what keeps us from God. That's what keeps us in the dark. That's what gives us spiritually blind eyes. But Jesus paid for the sins. He took care of them. He went to the cross, took the penalty due, paid the price, washed them away, rose again from the grave so that he could prove we can believe what he said about all those things and he invites you to trust him as Lord and Savior to turn away from however you're living now whatever that means and turn to a life where you're saying okay I'm going to follow him now I'm going, I'm going with him and you, you just need to respond just like the blind man here he said go wash in the pool now I already did the work just go wash in the pool and the, resp- and the man responded by doing that. And the response he's looking for from you is, I already did the work. I've already died on the cross and rose again. 
And if you would trust me, that will be applied to you and your spiritual eyes will be open and you'll be mine, you'll be forgiven forever. And you just make the decision. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust him and start following and walking him. And then watch what he does. So make, make that decision. Say yes to him. It's the first Sunday of the month, and we're, we're going to go back to the way we used to do communion. So let me talk about this for a second. Um, we have a couple of tables here with the juice and the uh, crackers. And we're going to have music playing. <clears throat> and you can come up at your leisure um, and to either side, grab a cracker, grab a cup, and while the music's playing, just have communion with the Lord. We're not going to wait to do it all together. Just have communion with the Lord, and when we're having communion, we're eating that bread, signifying his broken body. We're taking it in. He said, this is my body broken for you. You're taking that in. You're drinking the cup, signifying his blood, his shed blood given for us, the blood of the covenant drink that and have communion with the Lord. Remember the Lord. Think about the Lord. Think about his cross for you and have communion. So while the music's playing, uh, when you feel like it, come on up and have communion with the Lord. And then after um, it seems like everybody's done, we'll, we'll close up with one last song.
is yours. 